Good evening. Welcome to the 2020 Candidates Forum. I'm Jean McFarland, the program moderator. This segment features the candidates running for state senator in the 34th Senatorial District. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked of the candidates by members of the local media, The Record Journal. The second part will allow each candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer portion of the program, each candidate will have two minutes to respond. The opposing candidate will be allowed one minute for rebuttal. To conclude the program, each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. The toss of a coin has determined the order of questioning. Paul Ciccarella will be first. Before beginning the questioning, I'd like to introduce the candidates running for state senator in the 34th Senatorial District. They are April Capone, Democrat, and Paul Ciccarella, Republican. Mike Gagne, would you please ask your first question of Paul Ciccarella? Good evening. If elected to the 34th Senate seat, what will be your top priority? Uh, on the next legislative session. Thank you, Mike. My first priority is going to be jobs. Um, you know, we really need to bring jobs, and that's what's going to help us get us out of the financial mess that we're in. Um, we do need to concentrate on making sure people get back to work safely. So I think the first thing at hand is to find a way to make sure that our businesses could reopen and our jobs can be created. You know, I really believe part of creating the jobs is being more friendly for small business. And we need to do that by reducing the restrictions and fees to conduct business here in the state. I have my own business um, and we have the strictest regulations and highest fees to conduct business. As a licensed investigator in Connecticut, our fees are more than triple than the other highest state, which would be New Jersey. We really need to concentrate on deregulating and encouraging businesses to continue to grow. To put someone underneath my license, it could take up to 60 days to tell somebody that they have the job. I've talked to so many other business owners in different industries and they have the same burdens. We need to make it friendly for small businesses and businesses to flourish, where there are people, there needs to be jobs. And for there to be jobs, there needs to be businesses. So we need to be friendlier to small business. Ms. Capone. My top priority in the next legislative session will be COVID recovery. And I have a five point plan um, for uh, recovering from the pandemic. I think that the first thing that we need to do is inv invest in infrastructure in our state, and that will be with both state and federal funds. Um, we all know that uh, the uh, road system in our state needs serious investment. Those types of projects create jobs and they help stimulate the economy. Secondly, stimulating small business and supporting small business. Um, the governor announced an initiative uh, just this week Healthcare, protecting folks um, with healthcare and making sure that COVID related costs are covered. Education, everyone is facing uncertainty with sending their children back to school, making sure that children can do that safely. Students, parents, teachers, staff, all at the table making those decisions. And then I think as we do this, uh, that we um, are civil to one another, that we tackle our problems and not each other. Lauren Tacores, would you please ask your question of April Capone. Right. Connecticut recently reached a 3% COVID-19 positivity rate for the first time since June, and more than 200 people are now hospitalized with the virus. What plans would you support to mitigate a third wave of COVID infections? Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, well, as a healthcare professional um, working at Yale New Haven, as part of a clinical team, um, I want to be clear, I'm not a clinician myself, but I do work on a clinical team. You know, I've seen the virus and the impacts on our healthcare system, on our economy, um, on the physical and mental health of 
residents of our state as well as our country. I think that we need to continue to be thoughtful about how we move forward in reopening um, and we continue to adjust. I think that that means bringing all parties to the table. And as I had said uh, just a moment ago, I have a five point plan for how we recover from COVID, um, how we move forward, how we stimulate the economy, how we protect healthcare. Um, testing is vitally important, keeping our schools clean, making sure that everyone is adhering to the good practices of wearing masks, of social distancing, of taking on those, um, those just best practices that will keep us all healthy. And that's vital to our recovery and vital to staying healthy as a state. Connecticut has done a great job. Um, you can see that people are flocking into Connecticut. They're moving here um, because we have done a great job with that. And I think it's important to keep in mind uh, you know, what we've done to this point and uh, make sure that we are keeping our state safe as we move forward. Thank you. Mr. Chicarella. So as we know, COVID is very serious and we do need to take proper precautions to be safe and stop the spread, especially to our most vulnerable population. But we still need to do that with clear metrics so our small businesses can understand what they need to do so they could stay in business. And we have to have transparency and understand what those metrics are. When I talk to constituents as I'm walking, they describe it as a moving target. And they need to understand exactly what needs to happen or what they need to do to stay in business. Small businesses and small business owners are smart, creative, they find ways to adapt to changes in economy and the market, and they could handle providing a safe environment for their employees and their patrons, but they just need a clear understanding Thank, Thank you. you. Lauren Tacores, would you please ask your question of Paul Chicarella? According to the State Department of Labor, the state has recouped about 60% of jobs lost in March and April during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in mid-September, the state unemployment rate was estimated at 12 to 13%, and currently about 232,000 people are collecting unemployment benefits. How would you spur economic growth and jobs recovery? Okay. As I said earlier, we need to be friendlier to small businesses, and I think it's going to start with some deregulation. We need to stop and cut the red tape and allow the businesses to grow. Again, as their fees associated with doing business is understandable, but they can't be so high. Our licensing fees has doubled um, uh, three or four years ago, and the fees to do business continue to go up, and we cannot do that. Other things we could do to stimulate growth in the economy, specifically in jobs, is really try to adapt new ways to get jobs for children or kids coming out of school that don't want to go to college. We need to look at models like Sal Menzo's, where he went to the small businesses, he asked what they needed, he went to the schools, changed the curriculum, and students came out with good jobs, making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, and now helping the small businesses that are in the district and in the state. So we need to look and be creative on all different ways, but we should look to models like Sal Menzo's and see if we could stimulate the economy um, with the workforce that we have. Um, the kids coming out of high school right now have more technology in their pocket than the first ship to the moon. Um, so we should really call to their strengths and find a way to give them good paying jobs right out of school. Thank you. Ms. Capone. Thank you. You know, as a small business owner in the trades, I understand how vitally important small businesses are to the economy. Um, and as a small business owner, I know that our business is healthiest when working people have money in their pockets, when they make a decent living wage, when they can afford their housing, when they can afford to put food on the table, when they can afford their health care, 
then they have money to spend on small businesses, then they have money to stimulate the economy. So when we're talking about how to jumpstart the economy, the key is working people. And I think the key to that is supporting small business through some of the um, programs that were announced this week. Uh, with the $50 million investment from the state of Connecticut, that's a great start. And also infrastructure projects across the state. Mike Gagney, would you please ask your question of April Capone? Well, in addition to the pandemic's impact on small businesses and uh, the workforce, it seems clear that the pandemic is going to have a large impact in probably years and decades to come on the um, state budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you plan to handle future state budgets in light of this pandemic? So. You know, I think that um, the state budget right now, uh, at, you know, and as a former mayor, I really understand how the state budget impacts the municipal budgets and how that has an impact on everyone's local property taxes. Right now, through actions that were taken in the legislature, we have, the state has been able to refinance um, some of our debt. And that has brought costs down. Um, we've also created, the state has created a rainy day fund and anything over 50% goes to pay down the pension debts. Um, I think that that is uh, vitally important for stabilizing the state budget. Um, you know, one of the uh, key points here, I think, in Connecticut is tax equity. And we see in this district, in the 34th district, that the hardworking, working families of the 34th district are paying a larger portion of their income into state income taxes than the wealthiest in our state. The wealthiest, the billionaires that live in our state, none of which live in this district, um, pay a smaller portion of their income. And I think it's time that the wealthy pay their fair share. Mr. Ciccarello. So I do agree that the budget is an issue. And um, I do agree with um, candidate Capone that the budget that was passed in 2017 is instrumental in providing us to have that rainy day fund. And that was a bipartisan budget when it was tied in the House 1818. Some of the rules or decisions that were made out of that bipartisan budget allowed us to cap our spending, reduce our bonding, and we need to continue to make those tough decisions. As a small business owner, I understand that there needs to be tough decisions made. We cannot spend more than we make. and We simply cannot tax our constituents anymore. So we're going to have to go back and see where we're wasting money and reallocate those funds for things that are needed in district and in the state. Mike Gagney, would you please ask your next question of Paul Ciccarella? One of the topics that came up in the legislative session during 2019 was uh, regionalizing school districts. Uh, there was a handful of bills that were, you know, geared towards that topic ultimately didn't pass um, or passed in much limited fashion, uh, creating a, um, you know, commission on scared, shared school resources. Um, so in your view, who should be uh, in charge of making those decisions uh, regarding um, consolidation? Should it be up to, you know, state government or local uh, school board and municipal officials? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it should be up to the towns and the people within those towns um, and not the state. You know, no one knows the towns better than the people within the towns. And all towns and cities are different and they can't all be treated the same. They have different needs. So I, I truly believe that the state should not make the decisions for the small towns. We see how the DMV is ran. And we cannot have our children have to wait for an education like we have to do at the DMV. Um, a lot of our towns are doing a great job with the education, especially here in our district. So I think that it's most important that the municipalities make the decision and not the state. I do think it's a good idea to explore options in saving money. Um, I don't think that it's a good idea to merge schools, commute times, um, be very tough on the parents and the children. I do think that we could share resources, maybe superintendents, possibly multiple principals 
um, within schools, instead of having one at a school, maybe in an elementary, there may be one principal uh, to two schools. Um, but I think we could get creative to save money, but I think the decision should be on the municipality because they know the needs better than the state. Ms. Capone. I agree that the municipalities know best and really no one knows better than, uh, than, than the mayors and the first selectmen who um, you know, run those budgets and, and oversee those, uh, those districts. As a former mayor, I am acutely aware of how the Board of Education budget is typically at least 50% of the total town budget. Um, and those are dollars well spent. You know, there is no greater investment than investing in education. Um, having said that, we can regionalize some back office functions, functions that do not impact the student, things like um, purchasing and accounting. Those type of things can be combined. There can be a cost savings there without impacting the students directly. And as a former mayor, I understand that. I have that experience. I know how to get that job done. Lauren Tacores, would you please ask the next question of April Capone? In light of recent threats to the Affordable Care Act and a potential challenge to Roe v. Wade, what should the state do to protect vulnerable populations facing the possible loss of health care and access to, re to reproductive health care? So as a healthcare professional, I am uh, you know, acutely aware of how important health care is. And I have talked to probably thousands of people in this district throughout this campaign, and health care is a top priority. I am supportive of and will vote in favor of a bill that allows any state resident, if they choose, to buy into the state employee's health care plan or something similar. It's commonly referred to as a public option. And what that does is it gives more people access to affordable, reliable health care. Um, and when people have that access, they can get preventative care. Um, they can um, do those types of things uh, that they need to take care of before they become a real problem. I see it every day in my work at the hospital um, when small problems are left to linger because people don't have that access. So I wholeheartedly support the public option in giving folks um, access to care if they are, if they lose a job, if they are between jobs, if they'd like to start their own business. You know, when we talk about supporting small business, this would be a dramatic change, the public option. Um, when it comes to protecting pre-existing conditions, when it comes to protecting reproductive health care, that is something that we can do and I will do at the state level. Um, I have that experience and that is something that I support and that's something that residents can count on uh, if I am their senator. Mr. Chicarella. Thank you. So pre-consisting issues are covered and they're covered statutorily and that won't change. Um, Health care is definitely a concern of our constituents and it's something that needs to be addressed and, and, and soon. It's terrible that people work 40, 50 hours and have to choose between health care and food um, or health care and a mortgage. I know firsthand, 10 years ago when um, uh, I retired from the, the Department of Corrections on a medical disability and I started my business 10 years ago and they took my pension and health care away and I had to make the tough choice of health care or a mortgage and I had to sell my house and go move in with my mother and so I understand the challenges, and we need to find affordable health care, and we should look at Senator Kelly's plan, 328, and that will be able to make affordable health care, and, and we'll do it with common sense. We'll be able to make prescription prices more affordable Thank you. by making it competitive. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Paul Chicarella? What should white elected officials do to ensure that they're representing the, to ensure that they're representing constituents of all races and ethnicities. Sure. So, the first thing we need to do is listen. We need to listen to each other, um, and we need to make decisions 
how I, I teach my kids to make decisions how they judge people. And it's how they act and how they treat them. Not based upon color or ethnicity or religion. And I think that starts at the home, not in government. Um, and, and I teach to my children, everybody's equal. And you judge them on how they treat you. And I think we all need to start to do that. Um, again, listening is what needs to happen. Um, and I think that I have a unique ability to do that. Um, I am running as a Republican. Um, I'm endorsed by the Independent Party. Um, but a majority of my campaign staff um, is Democrat. I was raised a working class Democrat. So I think that that's going to give me a unique opportunity to reach across the party lines and speak to everybody, um, no matter what their uh, political affiliation is, their religion, their race. Um, and I think that's what politician needs to do is, is treat things um, case by case. Um, I don't think I should treat anybody different based upon their color. Um, I just think that we should all listen to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Capone. As a former mayor of a town um, that unfortunately had some uh, issues with uh, some former police officers um, racially profiling residents in town, I am very aware of the delicate nature of the situation. You know, East Haven took on those issues and now the East Haven Police Department um, is a national model in policing that came with training, um, that came with strong community relations. So I think not only um, is it about creating those community relations, but it's also about how we teach in our schools, having the curriculum that supports diversity, having um, a, a teaching staff that reflects um, our statewide population and being able to recruit and retain that, that diversity in teaching. Thank you. Mike Gagney, would you please ask the next question of April Capone? Yes. So Connecticut, uh, over the past several months, has experienced a significant drought. And uh, you know, that was offset partially by you know, a tropical storm Isais and the impacts there. Both of those um, weather events are stark reminders of what is to come if uh, climate change is not taken seriously? Mm -hmm. What would you do on the state level to make Connecticut a leader in climate action? So as a former mayor of a town that um, experienced a significant weather event, um, I was mayor of the town of East Haven during Hurricane Irene, which decimated our shoreline um, and really uh, caused damage throughout the entire town. We were told that was a you know, 100 year storm, a, a once in a lifetime. And then what happened? The next year, we got walloped with Sandy again. Um, so these storms are more frequent. It's about addressing climate change. It's about addressing the man-made nature of climate change and moving forward to um, creating policies that are help Connecticut be more resilient and that also make us more green. Um, you know, as mayor, I invested, I was on the forefront of investing in uh, clean energy for our town, solar panels and electric vehicle charging stations, um, creating a um, energy efficiency in some of our biggest um, energy users, which uh, was our ice rink. Um, so making Connecticut more green and green jobs are also another positive uh, consequence, if you will, of uh, making a cleaner environment. Um, so focusing on that, investing in that, understanding the realities and knowing that Connecticut can do its part to contribute to a greener country and a greener um, world as well. Mr. Ciccarella. So climate control is something to be concerned about and utilizing clean energy, I'm sure, will be a big part of that. Um, and, and I think that clean energy is a great idea, but we need to find a way to make it affordable. Clean energy is expensive, and we cannot implement policies or bills that are going to put any more fees on our residents. It is already super expensive to live in Connecticut with our rates and our taxes. I think 
clean energy is a great idea, but I think as legislators, we're going to need to find a way to make it more affordable before we start to force it on our residents. Thank you. Mike Gagne, would you please ask the next question of Paul Chicarella? Yes. So this earlier this year, the State Department of Labor had issued a stop work order against a uh, massage business in Wallingford here that was listed on a website featuring user-generated reviews of uh, sexual services. There were indications that the women inside were part of a prostitution ring. What should be done at the state level to curb human trafficking to Connecticut? So that is a problem. Um, with my law enforcement background and my investigation business now, um, trafficking, human trafficking, is a very serious problem. And, and how we combat that is supporting our law enforcement, providing them with training and funding to recognize and understand where this takes place and what needs to be done to stop it and combat it. But that's going to take training and funding. And right now, with the current bill that was proposed and passed, we're doing the opposite. We are not supporting our police, and we need our police to be proactive instead of reactive. So I strongly think uh, a part to stopping the human trafficking is going to be giving our officers and our investigators the tools needed to combat this very serious problem. Thank you. Ms. Capone. Thank you. So as a woman, I believe that whatever um, policies and decisions are created on human trafficking, women need to be at the table. Um, women aren't the only victims of human trafficking, but they are the majority of victims of human trafficking. And uh, I think women need to be at the table during the discussions. Um, you know, I agree that this has to do with empowering local law enforcement, and I know that because I've done it. You know, as mayor, I worked with our police department and created those trainings, um, funded those trainings, helped them create the situations that they needed to learn what causes human trafficking, how to stop it, how to recognize it, and um, how to enforce that. So I absolutely agree that there is tremendous power in empowering local law enforcement against human trafficking, and I know this because it's something that I have done as mayor. And it's something, that experience, that I would take up to the state capitol and continue that as a legislator. Lauren Takaris, would you please ask the next question of April Capone. All right. So ridership on the CT Rail Hartford line, um, which has a stop at the Wallingford Cherry Street train station, it's down 80% of what it was before the COVID-19 pandemic and home buying is rising rather than renting. So besides, invent, besides investing in transit-oriented development, mm -hmm. what other plans do you have for economic development in Wallingford? So, you know, as, as a mayor, I was part of the Council of Governments that worked on um, the new main streets and placemaking in Connecticut. And I think that that is very important to spur development. I think diverse housing stock is also very important. We want people to be able to live in Connecticut at every stage of their lives. Right? So when they are graduating college and have their first job, when they want to buy their first home, when they want to grow their family and buy their next home, when they want to downsize and retire, there should be affordable housing stock at every level and diverse housing stock at every level. Um, so I think that is really important to economic development. I think also empowering small businesses. And, you know, again, as a small business owner, I know that small business is healthiest when working people make a decent living wage and have money in their pockets to spend and live and enjoy. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the third thing is really looking at um, our transportation infrastructure and what has held us back. And we have lacked a significant investment in transportation in this state, and I think it's time that we change that. Mr. Chicarella. So economic de development is something that I feel strongly about, and I'm lucky to have a, a great leader and mentor in North Haven, uh, Mike Frieda, um, who is a champion to economic development. Um, and I think it takes um, 
communication skills, um, to put together a deal to bring people and businesses to our towns. But once they get there, we need to be friendly to them. Again, I speak to so many business owners that feel handcuffed. 20 years ago, somebody could build a sub-development and be approved um, in months. Now it takes years. And that stops houses from being built. That stops people from coming into those houses. We need to stimulate our economy, and we need to do it with deregulation and being friendly to our businesses. Thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Paul Ciccarella? All right, so the most controversial provision of the recent police accountability bill includes changes to what's known as qualified immunity, making it easier for those who believe they have been wronged by police to file lawsuits against officers, departments, and towns. How do you feel about this particular provision? So this police accountability bill um, is a problem um, for many ways. I'm sure it was attended for good, but unfortunately all too many times when bills are presented, there is unattended consequences that come along with them. This bill was rushed along much too fast, and it was done for political reasons, not for the people. I've spoke to three chief of police within my district and multiple law enforcement officers um, in town, out of town, as well as friends that were on the job with me. There are three really detrimental things in this bill that not only is not good for the police officers and their families, but for the community. Police accountability, it's scary for an officer to go to work every day to make sure they come home safe. But now they have to make sure that they're going to come home and not be sued for doing their job. And it's going to make police reactive instead of proactive. Another thing is the use of force directives. These need to be much more clear. The frivolous lawsuits that could come from this could be so catastrophic to our judicial system, which is already clogged. We really need to get back to the table and discuss some of these things because the fallout for our cities and, and, and suburbs is going to be devastating. And it's the truth. We see already in Hartford, shootings are up. And what we need to do to get these guns off the streets is to get rid of or bring back the ability to search a vehicle. That's where the guns are. That's where the drugs are. We need to get the guns and drugs off the street. If we can't search a vehicle with consent, how are we going to have the officers do their jobs to get guns off the street? We need to support our law enforcement officers, and I urge that we need to address this when we get back into session for the sake of our communities. Thank you. Ms. Capone. So as a former mayor, I know that no one in any municipality or in state government can be sued for doing their job within the bounds of their job. That's first and foremost, every employee is indemnified by the town or the state. Um, second of all, you know, as someone who worked on police reform to see a department uh, go from uh, having notorious issues where four police officers were sent to federal prison for racially profiling uh, and violating the civil rights of town residents to now a department that is a national model um, across the country. You know, I have that experience and I have done that work. Um, the East Haven Police Department has done a complete turnaround and I am so proud of the work that they have done. I will tell you, officer morale is up, community confidence is up, and crime is down. That's the experience that I will bring to the state legislature. And yes, this new bill does need to be tweaked. Absolutely. There are things that need to, uh, need to be looked at. And I bring a unique perspective and the experience to do that. Thank you. Mike, would you please ask the next question of April Capone? Uh, this past summer, Eversource customers who opened their utility bills were um, surprised when they saw you know, what amounted to a rate increase that basically made electric bills double. Um, shortly after that, we had our tropical storm East Ice, which saw you know, widespread power outages statewide. Um, and both of those uh, brought the legislature to step in and uh, create regulations that you know, com compensated cons customers for you know, you know, lost food during you know, long power outages, but 
in your view, what else could be done to ensure that you know the most vulnerable residents uh, aren't taken advantage of by you know utility companies such as you know Eversource? Thank you, Mike. So. As Mayor V. Steven, during Hurricane Irene, um, we, m much of our town lost power for close to a week. That was in 2011. And since then, customers have faced um, rate increases from both Eversource and UI. Um, and we have been told that those increases are going to harden the infrastructure. Clearly that has not happened. Um, and that is part of the issue. Um, you know, I appreciate what the legislature has done in this new uh, new energy bill of rights that they've passed um, that gives consumers $25 per day uh, if, they are, um, if they are out of power and reimburses them for lost food. That really, that helps protect vulnerable people because losing the entire contents of your fridge, which you maybe couldn't have afforded to, barely afford to fill in the first place is problematic. And that's something that I dealt with when I was mayor in 2011 um, after Hurricane Irene. I think that, you know, it is very easy to say that we have too much regulation in Connecticut, but you can see what happens when energy companies or big business is left to its own devices, and this is a problem. So I think the legislature has gone in to correct that. Um, I think that we need to look at Wallingford Electric as a model for the state. I mean, I haven't met anyone uh, in all of my time canvassing Wallingford who doesn't love it. Um, they do a great job. The rates are reasonable, the outages are few and far between, and I think it should be held up as a model for the rest of the state. Thank you. Mr. Ciccarella. One thing before I answer that, um, I did say I did speak to all the police officers within the, the district, and um, crime is up, unfortunately, and that's something that needs to be addressed. It is up. Um, regarding the cost of the UI bills, you know, that needs to be addressed. UI, we are the second highest in the country to Hawaii. And we need to find a way to make these bills more affordable for our constituents that already have such a hard time making ends meet. What I think we really need to do is, is look at small towns like Wallingford that handle it and are able to provide a reliable and a reasonably cost service to their constituents. Another way that we could really reduce the cost is to get the decision making process back on the table of legislators and not let Pira and Deep make those decisions. Um, we need our legislators to make those decisions. They're tough, but if we make them, I'm sure Thank our rates you. will go down. Mike Gagney, would you please ask the next question of Paul Ciccarella? One of the um, Situations that become more apparent during uh, the pandemic is uh, housing insecurity. And um, this is addressed in part um, to a moratorium enacted at the state level um, to prevent evictions. But um, tonight, what steps would you take uh, to prevent a significant number of individuals and families um, from becoming homeless um, when those moratoriums are lifted? I may have missed a little bit of that, but I'll do my best to answer that. Um, so it, it is a, a very big problem. Um, there are a lot of people that are unfortunately unable to pay their rent, um, and we need to provide assistance for those. But there's a lot of people that are able to pay their rent and aren't doing so. Um, so I think we need to handle it um, on an individual basis. I don't think we could uh, make it a one-size-fits-all uh, situation. Um, I think we need to find a way for mediators to hear these cases out, um, maybe present some type of a discovery or proof of their funds. And if they can't afford it, I think we do need to help them. Um, uh, you know, we can't have people on the streets and we are in tough times, um, but I think uh, they need to be dealt with individually um, in one case at a time. Um, it's not gonna be easy, but that's how that should be addressed. Um, I think a, a better way of solving that problem is getting people back to work. We need to find a way to get people back to work. We need to keep our businesses open. And we need more businesses to come to the state. Unfortunately, so many businesses are leaving because it's just cheaper to do business other places. And we need to see that that's a pattern. 
And, and all too often, the businesses are leaving, families are going with the businesses, and it's leaving the constituents that stay holding the bill. And we need to learn from our mistakes. We cannot continue to do the same thing. We need jobs for these people that cannot afford to live. Thank you. Ms. Capone. Thank you. So I faced something similar when I was mayor of East Haven during um, the 2008 economic crash and the housing foreclosure crisis. We had um, massive foreclosure rates. And what I did was I marshaled state, local, and federal resources to bring them directly to people where they needed them. Um, and it was about catching people early to make sure that they didn't uh, slip too far into foreclosure that they couldn't get out. It was about bringing people the services that they needed, and I did that as mayor. I think that um, you know what I believe in, again, as a state senator, is a five-point plan that involves infrastructure, small business, protecting health care, and protecting education, and that will help us recover from this crisis. When working people have money in their pockets, the entire econ economy of the state is healthier. Thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of April Capone? Okay. Do you agree with the state's decision to repeal the Property Transfer Act, which replaced the system in which hazardous waste cleanup must be done when a property was sold, with a release-based system in which the cleanup must be done as soon as the owner becomes aware of the problem? Um, thank you. Yeah, I think that we need to um, be thoughtful about that. And I think identifying and cleaning up these problems as we see them, uh, you know, when, when we become aware is generally better than waiting until a property is sold. You know, as Mayor V. Steve and I worked on a number of Brownfields projects and we got Brownfields grants to clean up. We worked with property owners and, uh, you know, to, to get these grants and clean up these properties so that they could be sold, so that they could be redeveloped. And the redevelopment is very important, but so is the cleanup. Uh, the cleanup is important for the environment. It's also important because sometimes when you have these brownfields, they are also blighted. So it can bring down the entire, um, the entire economy. New businesses don't want to move in, and you find that just a cleanup of one of these brownfields can just re-energize an entire neighborhood. I've seen it happen. I've done it. You know, as mayor, those were projects that I was involved in. So I think the sooner that you can get to that, the better it is for the economy, the better it is for the environment, the better it is for the neighborhood. So I, I do support being thoughtful about getting to those projects as quickly as possible. Yes. Mr. Chicarella. Um, I do agree um, that we need to take care of um, those areas and make sure they're safe to build on because we don't know what will be built there. And I do think prior to a sale or a transfer um, that there needs to be transparency so the person that is investing into that property knows what they're uh, going to be dealing with. And I don't think it's right to leave uh, the burden on the person um, um, that's coming in. And I don't think that we should run away from a, a, an issue. I think it should be solved before it gets sold. Um, so I, I think that um, it's important to make sure that we are cleaning um, the properties from any kind of chemical waste because um, again it could be detrimental to the health of people that are going to be coming in um, and there could be a lot of other um, issues that may arise from that. Thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Paul Chicarella. All right. Tens of thousands of state residents will be voting by absentee ballot this year should the state move to implement mail-in voting statewide and consider retiring the in-person polling place? So voting is very important. It's a constitutional right, and I think it needs to be protected and make sure everybody has an opportunity to vote. Um, in theory, it sounds like a great idea um, to mail in and, and, and be able to do that, but I don't think those decisions should be made until you really know that um, it could be done. As we see now, we're in the process of mailing out ballots and um, the state went ahead and mailed those out and now the burdens on um, the town halls and, and, and um, the employees there and I speak to them and they're saying that it's a challenge and they're working hard and the burden gets put on the town. And when we make decisions 
and just go at it and don't think about the consequences that are going to come from those decisions. These are the things that happen. Um, uh, I do think it's important that everybody votes. I think that it was a great idea um, that there was a bipartisan, I guess, amendment um, allowing people to have a no excuse mail in ballot. We have a plan in place. Um, people could request a ballot for no reason um, that doesn't need to be out of state, military, etc. And we did that bipartisan. And they could mail in their ballot. So I, I think that that is an adequate way to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to vote. I still believe that it's important that people could go in person. They want to make sure their vote's getting in and they have the right to do that. Um, so that's, that's my opinion on that situation. Ms. Capone. Thank you. So, you know, I have taught American government at Gateway Community College uh, off and on for almost the last 10 years. And I always tell my students that democracy is stronger when more people can participate, when more people can access their legal right to vote. Uh, we have had this absentee ballot system in effect in the state of Connecticut for years and years. So what we're doing this year is just a scale up of a, of a system that has already existed. And it's a sound system. Um, and hats off to the hardworking town clerks and staff in the town halls who are scaling up this system this year. What I want people to know is whether you vote by absentee ballot and you put it in the mail, you put it in the drop box outside town hall, or you show up to your polling place on election day, it is safe and it is effective and everyone needs to participate in their legal right to vote and I urge people to do that this year. I, would, um, I am in support of giving folks as many options to access their legal right to vote as possible. Mike Gagne, would you please ask the last question of the night to April Capone? As you are going out um, canvassing uh, constituents and hearing what they're telling you, um, what are the most important issues that are coming up? And also, what are you thinking about that your constituents should be thinking about? So the top two issues that I'm hearing are COVID and COVID recovery. These are uncertain times. And people are looking for experience and experienced leaders to lead them through uncertain times. Um, you know, and that's why I developed this five-point plan that talks about rebuilding our infrastructure, investing in our small business, protecting healthcare during COVID and access to healthcare, protecting children in our schools and students, staff, and teachers in our school system. So people are very concerned. They are uncertain. Um, they want to know that we can recover from COVID, um, you know, economically, physically, and and mentally, emotionally from this pandemic and all that we've endured. And I think that they are looking for real experienced leadership to do that. And the other um, issue that is a really big issue is healthcare. Um, and as a healthcare professional, you know, I understand how important affordable, reliable healthcare is to people throughout their lives. And that's why I support a plan that would allow any state resident, if they chose, to buy into the state employee's health care plan or something similar. Um, it is typically referred to as the public option. It will help small businesses. It will spur an entrepreneurship. It will make sure that people can, if they choose, decouple health care from their job. And that just gives them another option if they lose a job if they decide to retire early, if they leave the workforce for whatever reason, they know that they still can be covered in a way that is affordable and reliable. So those are the top two issues that I hear. Thank you. Mr. Chicarella. So for the last six months, I've been out canvassing just about every day, and I've been talking to the constituents, and their concerns are COVID and getting back to normal, and what our financial situation is going to look like when that happens. They're also worried about affordable health care. Um, but a lot of questions I get is about the divisiveness in politics. Um, it comes up often. I think that um, I'm going to be able to bring a different perspective uh, to Harford and be able to voice my opinion and the opinions of our constituents. Um, I am running as a Republican. I'm endorsed by the Independent Party. And like I said, I have a tremendous amount of Democratic support. My campaign manager is a Democrat. And, and I ensure them that I'm going to go there and make decisions based upon 
the ideas, not party lines. If it's a good idea and it's going to help our constituents, I'm going to vote for that. And, and they were happy to hear that. There needs to be bipartisanship. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Each candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement. Mr. Ciccarella, will you please begin? Thank you. And thank you, Ms. McFarlane and the uh, Women League of Voters um, and the Record Journal for putting this together and also all of your coverage throughout the campaign. I mean, thank you to candidate Capone for attending. Um, I really like to take the opportunity to thank my family, friends, and all the volunteers that have been helping and, and putting in countless hours. I, I truly couldn't be doing it without them. Um, I do want to thank all of the residents that um, allowed me to bother them at all hours of the day and night and take the time to talk to me. Um, I was honored when Len Fasano approached me, our current senator, and asked me if I would consider to be his predecessor. Um, I put a lot of thought into it. Um, and, and I really think that my life experiences um, are valuable to bring to Hartford. I grew up in East Haven. I was born and raised and attended local area schools. Um, there, my parents instilled values into me that I think I, I will bring to the Capitol, which are honesty, integrity, empathy, and kindness. Um, I attended local high schools where I excelled in wrestling, and I've got valuable lessons from my teachers and coaches, specifically my wrestling coach, where I've learned the value of hard work and discipline. And again, I'll bring those to Hartford. Um, I also coached high school wrestling, which was a great experience to mentor the kids, as my wrestling coach did for me. I learned so much from them. Um, in that time, I was in law enforcement, and unfortunately, I did get hurt on the job. Um, it forced me to open a, a small business, um, and, and, and there, I'm going to bring a lot of valuable experience. Not all experience is good experience, um, but my experience in business has been good. Um, you have to make tough decisions. You have to know how to spend money. And you don't have to save money. Before we could go out and buy a piece of equipment or spend any funds, we need to make sure we have that money before we could spend it, and that's common sense. And that's another thing I hope to bring to the Capitol. I now live in North Haven with my wife and two children, and I'm most importantly and first and foremost a father. Um, and, and that's one of the really biggest reasons that I'm gonna be doing this is for my family and all the families in the district. I understand the needs of working families. Um, you know, my wife is on the PTA, and uh, we hear the stories um, and, and concerns and issues that the teachers are facing, the students, and the parents. And I'm going to work hard to be that voice. When I get up to the Capitol, I'm going to work on getting jobs, work on affordable health care, and providing a safe place for our kids to get their educations and supporting our law enforcement officers. I hope I could count on your support on November 3rd, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Ms. Capone. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Wallingford Community Women, the Record Journal, and my opponent also for, for being here and making this a spirited debate. Um, my name is April Capone, and I am running to be the next senator from the 34th District in the state of Connecticut, and also the first woman to ever occupy that role. Um, I live in North Haven now with my family. I've been there about five years. Um, my husband and I have a high schooler at home. And together, my husband and I own two small businesses in town. For the last nearly 18 years, he's owned a plumbing and heating company. And about two years ago, together, we opened a drain cleaning company. Uh, that's hard work. It happens on nights and weekends. Uh, it is often, uh, you know, dirty work also. Uh, but it's a service that, that people really need. Um, and, you know, I, I don't mind... Um, Doing, getting my hands dirty to help people. Uh, I also work at Yale New Haven Hospital. I've been there for about four years, and I manage the Center for Living Organ Donors. So I work with people who give a kidney or part of their liver while they are alive to someone else who is in need of transplant. A little over 10 years ago, I became a living donor myself when I donated my kidney, and it was the best thing I have ever done in my life. Um, I grew up in the town of East Haven, and I served as East Haven's mayor for two terms. I served through a number of crises and challenges as mayor, including the housing collapse of 2008 and Hurricane Irene in 2011. And in both of those situations, I used 
state, local, and federal resources to bring people the help that they needed in a crisis. Experience matters, and it matters in a crisis. People are, are going through an uncertain time. We are all wondering what's going to happen next um, with this pandemic, with our jobs, with our kids at school, um, with our own health. And they are looking to leadership and they are looking to experienced people who know how to execute a plan, who have done this before. You know, a state legislator really has three jobs. The first job is to read and understand the bills that come before you and vote in the best interest of your constituency. The second job is to make sure that the, that the tax dollars we send up to Hartford come back to the district in a way that benefits the district. And as a former mayor, I know what it's like to need those dollars to balance your budget. I know what it's like to count on that, to keep property taxes in check in our towns. And I'll be a partner for the mayors and for selectmen in this state. And the last thing that we do is we work with individual constituents to help them cut through the red tape when dealing with state agencies. You know, I've done all of these jobs and that's why I am ready on day one um, to take over as the state senator in the 34th district. And that's why I'm asking you for your vote to become the next state senator and the first woman to serve the 34th Senate district in the state of Connecticut. Thank you so much. Thank you. This concludes the 34th senatorial district segment of the 2020 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford community women, I thank you for watching and remind you to please vote on November 3rd.